The last day of February was a chilly one in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. 29-year-old Loy Evans, a Kansas resident working as a legal secretary, drove into the parking garage of the law office in which she was employed. Intelligent, driven, and hardworking, the elegant blonde spent much of her morning and early afternoon completing various tasks. When one of them stretched out longer than she had expected, she decided to shift her brake. Leaving around two that afternoon, Loy drove down to some local businesses and did a little shopping. She was seen by multiple witnesses and appeared to be safe and conducting her life as normal. Sometime before 3 p.m., she drove back into the garage and parked in her designated space, but she never made it back to the office. When her employers noticed her absence, they contacted her husband, and after notifying police, he went downtown searching desperately for his missing wife. From the first moments of the investigation, detectives believed that foul play had been involved. The problem was, they had absolutely nothing in terms of solid evidence. They would be stymied by a lack of information and in leads, referring to Loy as seeming to have vanished from the face of the earth. Over the course of the next year, Loy's disappearance would be at the center of a storm of speculation, contradictory theories, and unverified claims. What exactly happened to Loy that cold afternoon has never been determined, and 47 years later, her name remains on the file of the oldest unsolved missing persons case in Kansas City history. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 244, The Vanishing of Loy Evans. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the disturbing and perplexing disappearance of 29-year-old wife, daughter, sister, and aunt, Loy Evans, the oldest unsolved missing persons case in Kansas City. This is episode 244, The Vanishing of Loy Evans. Loy Gillespie was born on Friday, December 12, 1947, to parents William and Jewel in Coffeyville, Montgomery County, Kansas. Loy was the couple's first child, and three years later, in 1950, they would have their second and last, a son named John. Loy grew up in and around Coffeyville, located in the southeastern corner of the county. While today, the city remains the most populous in Montgomery, the most recent data shows a population of less than 10,000. Throughout her youth and teens, the city was at its peak, boasting a population of nearly 20,000 residents. Locals described Coffeyville at the time as a big little city. While enterprise and industry had expanded, social relations remained tight and close-knit. According to the family and supported by census data, Loy's parents were both listed as farmers in the 1950s. She and her brother would be raised in a small white house on West 4th Street in a gridded patchwork of intersecting streets not far from downtown proper. The Gillespies have been described as blue-collar, devout Christians who were very involved with the church, which, given the time and location, would put them in the majority of their friends and neighbors. When it comes to Loy herself, descriptions tend not to vary much, with several key characteristics always being mentioned. She was caring, tender, polite, smart, talented, immaculately organized, and cleanly. There appeared to be somewhat of a dichotomy as well, with many saying that while Loy was a beautiful young woman who was kind, welcoming, and friendly, she was also somewhat hampered by a deep-seated shyness which could initially put others off. Essentially, some would mistake this shyness for snobbishness. But once Loy felt comfortable and pulled down the curtain, she made friends easily and would be devoted to them for life. As a teenager, she would go on to attend Field Kinley Memorial High School, located just a few blocks from her home. Loy was extremely studious and intelligent, scoring high marks in the classroom and participating in different clubs and extracurricular activities. She entered her senior year in the fall of 1965, and according to her yearbook, 
She earned the award for perfect attendance, was in the French club, was secretary treasurer of the student government, and was a candy striper amongst other groups and clubs. Given her warm and caring nature as the end of high school approached, she found herself drawn to the possibility of pursuing a career in nursing. 1965, as it turned out, would also be a fateful year for the young woman who would eventually meet and fall in love with an older guy. 19 years old at the time, Coffeyville native Donald Evitz met Loy when she was 17, and the two quickly developed a romantic interest. The couple went out on their first date on the evening of Thursday, November 4th, seeing the film Cat Baloo at the local theater. According to everyone that knew the young couple, they quickly developed a strong bond, and it was clear to their friends and family that they were deeply committed to one another. During this time, Don was attending Pittsburgh State University, not to be confused with Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, located just 75 miles northeast of Coffeyville. Don would later note that during this time, the two frequently wrote letters back and forth and on the weekends when he had no classes, he would hop in his Firebird and drive back home to spend time with Loy. She would go on to graduate from high school in the spring of 66 and began attending college in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she majored in nursing. Two years later, in 1968, Don enlisted in the Army and was sent to Fort Leonard Wood, a military base located in the south-central Missouri Ozarks. Much as had been the case with Pittsburgh, Don devoted any free time and leave he accrued to traveling to spend time with Loy. Whether he was driving to Tulsa or Coffeyville, he didn't mind as long as the two could be together. He would eventually be sent overseas to serve in Vietnam, and during this time, he and Loy wrote to each other on a weekly basis. Being that he wouldn't need his car while he was away, Don allowed her to drive the Firebird, and she fell in love with it. Around this time, Loy decided to change her future plans as well, and left Tulsa to instead attend Kansas State University in the city of Manhattan, located 200 miles northeast of Coffeyville. There, she changed her major from nursing to clothing and retailing. According to friends, she decorated a bulletin board in her dorm room with pictures of Don that he would send over, as well as all of their letters. When he went on leave to Hawaii, she flew out to visit, and when he was back in the States, he spent all of his free time with her. As years passed on, the two would only grow closer, and it appeared from the outside looking in that they had, in fact, found their soulmates in one another. During her time at KSU, Loy was involved in a lot of activities and was also nominated for School Queen alongside a handful of others. Always noted as being stunningly beautiful, Loy's nomination was actually hand-picked by musician Glenn Campbell of Wichita Lineman fame. Although she did not win the title, it didn't appear to mean much to the 22-year-old senior. Interestingly, while people have most frequently commented on Loy's physical appearance and attractiveness, for Loy herself, she didn't appear to be much affected by it, keeping a shy, almost demure disposition. In the spring of 1971, she graduated from KSU with honors, having earned her degree, and when Don finished up his enlistment with the Army, the two decided to make things official. On Saturday, November 4th, 1972, the seventh anniversary of their first date, the two were married in a small ceremony back home in Coffeyville. Delighted and thrilled to be together, the happy couple would only linger in their hometown for a short while before life drew them northeast to where they purchased a small home in Overland Park, less than four miles west from the Kansas-Missouri border and just outside of the busy mecca of Kansas City. Their home, located along Concert Street, was a three-bedroom, two-bathroom bungalow built in the late 50s. The two loved the home they shared together, and immediately upon moving in, they began constructing happy memories, whether they were painting, purchasing furniture, or packing the house with antiques. Loy had a love for shopping. This is frequently reported by friends and family, and Don had a way with his hands, where oftentimes she would bring home an old piece of furniture and he would proceed to fix it up and refinish it. Over the course of the next five years, the couple built a life for themselves. Despite having pursued a degree in clothing and retailing, 
Loy would end up working as a legal secretary for a couple of different law firms in the Kansas City area. Don, on the other hand, picked up work as an insurance auditor for Fireman's Fund, then located at 720 Main Street in downtown Kansas City. Though they didn't make a lot of money, the couple were happy with what they had and spent much of their time together. They might go out to a movie or have dinner out, but they weren't much into partying and the scene wasn't really for them, with Don describing Loy as more of an introvert, a homebody. They had their groups of friends, but the two generally preferred to spend time back at the house. Whether they were working on a new antique or if Dom was firing up his camera and shooting photos of his beloved wife, they just liked living their own quiet lives. By the winter of 1977, little had changed, though the couple had seen some improvements financially. Don was promoted from auditor to premium audit manager, and Loy changed jobs, getting hired on at the firm of Miller, Simmons, Moore, and Young, located then at 800 West 47th Street, placing her five miles south of her husband's Main Street offices. According to Don, this was the happiest time in their lives. They had been together for 11 years, married for five, and they were excited to see what their next adventure might be. He was 31 and she 29, and while both had made their own careers, the possibility of children lingered on the horizon. It could be their next big step in expanding the family they had already found in one another. But tragically, less than three months into the new year, Loy would mysteriously vanish and Don would be devastated, wallowing in the pain and grief of his collapsing world. Monday, February 28th, was a chilly day in Kansas City. Temperatures peaked at just 55 degrees while strong winds blew in from the southwest. According to investigators, the day began like any other Monday, with Don and Loy exchanging goodbyes as they left their Overland Park home, heading for their jobs in Kansas City. She climbed into her bright yellow 1970 MGB sports car. Even with cold winter temperatures and a car that didn't have the greatest heater, she absolutely loved the vehicle, and according to friends and family, even if a distance was an easy walk, she would often choose to drive just because she loved being behind the wheel of her two-seater. It was a short drive for her, traveling less than 10 miles, and if streets were clear enough, she could really open it up and listen to the roar of the engine. Located directly behind the building that housed the law firm at Country Club Plaza, Loy pulled into the parking garage, which ran parallel to Summit Street, and slowly moved into her assigned spot, number 98. The rectangular-shaped parking garage ran north to south and had multiple levels accessible via short cement staircases. While some of the west side of the garage was partially lit by the morning and midday sun, Loy's parking space in the northeast corner of the fourth level was shrouded in a large shadow cast by a nearby apartment building. According to co-workers, Loy arrived in the office that morning and appeared to be in a good mood, polite and kind as she is often noted to have been. Throughout the morning, she completed several tasks that were part of her typical Monday morning routine, but things changed around lunchtime. Normally, Loy would take her lunch break between 1 and 1.30, but on this day, she was caught up at work and decided to push through the normal break, planning instead to go later in the afternoon. It would be reported that Loy mailed her paycheck to her bank for direct deposit and then is thought to have left for her lunch hour around 2.10 p.m., but she would never return. She had a habit of working later than her scheduled off time, so when she hadn't returned to the office by 3.30, her co-workers certainly noticed, but no one thought anything about this was out of the ordinary. When another hour passed, though, people in the office began wondering if she had gotten into an accident or been held up in some way. 30 minutes later, at approximately 5 p.m., an employee went down into the parking garage and noted that Loy's car was parked in her assigned space, but there was no sign of the 29-year-old herself. Unaware of the growing concern around her absence, Don completed his shift at work and arrived home shortly after 5 p.m. According to him, moments after he entered the home, he could hear the phone ringing, and when he answered, it was the law firm that Loy worked for. 
They were wondering why the 29-year-old hadn't returned from her lunch break that afternoon, but all of this was news to Don. Interestingly, while it was initially reported that Loy often stayed late at work, Don said it was rare for her to come home late from work, which made him concerned from the moment he received that call. Trying to believe that there must have been some legitimate reason for her lateness, Don placed calls to several friends in search of his wife. After being unable to locate her, Don picked up the phone and contacted the police. According to reporting of the time, Don's initial call came in between 6 and 7 p.m., depending on the source, which would be roughly one to two hours after he was notified by his wife's employer. Don's call went to the local police in Overland Park, though they would notify the Kansas City police in regard to the missing persons report. Outside of notifications being made and Loy's description being dispatched, the real investigation wouldn't begin until the following day as they informed Don that he should wait 24 hours. Later in the evening, after calling police, Don was notified that a friend of Loy's had gone to see a movie not far from the law office, so he drove down to the theater to check. While he managed to locate this friend, he was quickly informed that Loy had not gone along to the movie. Not knowing what else to do, he left the theater and went over to Country Club Plaza. He walked around the building where his wife was employed, then expanded his search area block by block, and ultimately searched on his own for hours, later telling the Kansas City Times that he searched until midnight, at which point he decided to head home and sit by the phone, hoping for news from the police, or better yet, a call from Loy herself. Unfortunately, Anytime the phone did ring, it was a friend or relative asking for an update, which at that time, there was none to give. The following day, Tuesday, March 1st, police officers kicked off the full investigation in earnest. After speaking with Loy's co-workers and Don, they started canvassing the area in search of Loy or anyone who may have seen or interacted with her the previous day. Sergeant John Wilson, head of the Kansas City Police Department's Missing Persons Unit, was assigned as lead on the case and quickly noted that within the first few hours, they'd managed to find multiple witnesses who had seen Loy on her lunch break after her co-workers had seen her for the last time. It appeared that upon taking her break, the 29-year-old had traveled just a few blocks east of the office building to run errands and do a little shopping. Based upon interviews with witnesses, police managed to put together a fairly detailed timeline of events, tracking Loy's movements and interactions from the moment she left her office right up until she mysteriously vanished. I should preface this by noting that, according to old and new maps, this area of Kansas City has changed quite a bit since 1977, so store locations and even street arrangements are not precise today to what they were back then. According to investigators, Loy left the law office at approximately 2.10 p.m. and walked the short distance to the parking garage where she climbed into her yellow MGB. She then proceeded east, parking the vehicle near the intersection of West 47th and Warnell Road, a distance of approximately three-tenths of a mile. After parking, she crossed Warnell Road in a westward direction, then turned south and proceeded approximately 450 feet to the Hellsberg's Jewelry Store, still today located at 400 Nichols Road. Employees informed detectives that Loy had come into the store to have a watch adjusted. It had been a gift from Don. After exiting the jewelers, Loy turned north and walked back up Warnell. Turning east, she walked past her parked car and entered the Rothschild's department store at 237 West 47th Street, traveling a little over a tenth of a mile. According to investigators, she browsed through the store for a short period of time, but then left and turned back towards the west. Walking past her car again, she traveled just shy of 500 feet, moving from the Rothschilds over to a location of a former Macy's department store. According to police, she browsed through the store and eventually went down into the basement floor where plants were stored. There, she spoke to an employee and asked a few questions about a particular plant, but ultimately did not make a purchase. Heading south, 
She crossed West 47th Street and made a short 130-foot walk from the Macy's back to her car, which again was parked at 47th and Warnell. Entering the vehicle, Loy turned east and drove to Main Street, where she made a left and proceeded north for a little over a mile, arriving at 3948. At the time, this was the location of a Skaggs drugstore. Though the building looks very much the same as it did in 1977, it is today a nonprofit called Drugstore KC, which offers studio space and opportunities to local artists. At the pharmacy, she picked up a prescription and purchased a yellow umbrella. Exiting the store, Loy is thought to have done a few minutes worth of window shopping in the area before hopping back into her car and driving a little over a mile southwest, back to the parking garage, entering via Summit Street to the east. From that point on, though, investigators have never been able to determine what happened. Louis' car was found parked in its assigned spot with the doors unlocked. Inside, they recovered several items, including a rag used to wipe the windshield, a donut bag, and the stem of a carnation that Don had given her. They also found the yellow umbrella sitting on the passenger seat with the Skaggs drugstore tag still attached. There was no evidence of a struggle in or around the vehicle, nor were they able to find any witnesses who reported hearing anything unusual. Based upon witness accounts, Louis' car was noted as being in that parking lot by 3 p.m., suggesting she still had about 10 minutes left on her break when she got back. Police theorized that someone had grabbed the 29-year-old as she was walking back towards the office. Investigators would later note they did manage to find two witnesses who both saw different vehicles speeding out of the parking garage around the time Loy is thought to have been abducted. One vehicle, which was never described, was tracked down by police. The owner was brought to the station for questioning and later released, apparently cleared of any involvement. The other vehicle, spotted by a delivery man, was described as a brown van. According to the witness, the driver sped out of the parking garage with such haste that he nearly crashed into another vehicle, and then, as he passed the delivery man, he used one of his hands to obscure his face so that the witness was unable to give a description of him. This van would become a focus for the investigation, but tracking down a vaguely described brown van would prove extremely difficult as vans were very popular at the time. Asked about the possibility that perhaps Loy had chosen to leave of her own volition or that something else may have happened, authorities were fairly certain that this had been an abduction. Sergeant John Wilson would explain to the Kansas City Times, saying, quote, Nothing we have at this time would lead us to believe she left of her own accord. Right off, we smelled foul play. A woman like that doesn't just vanish. She parked her car, and that's where we lose her. That's the end of Loy Evans. End quote. For investigators, it was extremely frustrating. They were able to track Loy all the way up until around 3 p.m., and after that, there was nothing. They didn't even have any solid clues, with detectives describing the disappearance by saying it was as if the woman had simply vanished from the face of the earth. Within the first days of the investigation, following interviews with store employees, shoppers, and workers in the area, detectives obtained between 50 and 60 leads to chase down. Unfortunately, for the most part, those leads didn't pan out, and police found themselves set back to square one, baffled by how the missing woman had vanished from such a busy area without anyone really seeing anything. In addition to leads collapsing, they didn't really have any evidence either. Louis' car was clean of any unidentified fingerprints, and they couldn't find anything to indicate whether she had been forcefully taken or if, perhaps, she had willingly gotten into a vehicle with someone she knew, not knowing that they had ill intent. Without anywhere to truly focus their attention, investigators were determined to dig into Loy's life, believing they might find a motive or person of interest there. In discussions with friends, family, co-workers, and former co-workers, all the way back to her teenage years in Coffeyville, detectives were struck by how similarly people described and discussed the missing woman. Everyone stated that she was a smart young woman who, while being somewhat shy, was also very welcoming, loving, and kind. 
No one had a bad word to say about her, and no one had any awareness of a secret or dark side to her life. Investigators themselves hit dead ends when they found no debts or financial issues, no problems at home, no secret romances or jealous exes. Sergeant John Wilson would later comment about this to the Kansas City Star, saying, quote, This is the first saint I've ever seen. Everybody says that she's perfect, and I haven't hardly been able to disprove it. End quote. At Loy's office, things changed as many of the female employees felt concerned for their safety, especially in the parking garage. Arrangements were made so that women walked to their cars in groups or were escorted by male co-workers. Everyone was freaked out about the disappearance and worried someone could possibly be targeting that particular garage and area. Law enforcement didn't necessarily concur with that opinion, though. While they lauded the law firm for taking security precautions, they did not believe someone was hunting victims in the area. More likely, they presumed, someone had either specifically targeted Loy or she'd found herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, they lacked much evidence to support their theory one way or the other. From Jump Street, they believed that Loy had been the victim of foul play, but they still needed to look into the possibility that she may have planned her own disappearance. Back at the home in Overland Park, they went through everything, only to discover that all of the missing woman's belongings had been left behind outside of the clothing on her back and the contents of her purse. In a perplexing sea of unknowing, one thing became clear. If Loy did plan her own disappearance, and if she had any assistance, it had been kept so top secret that no one in her life had even the slightest hint. While unable to completely rule out the possibility, investigators had found absolutely nothing to support the theory, nor any leads to pursue in that regard. Sergeant Wilson requested assistance from the FBI, who quickly classified the case as a kidnapping going on to alert law enforcement agencies throughout both Missouri and Kansas. Investigators who had initially believed they would find answers quickly were slowly coming to terms with the harshness of reality. You can work a case without evidence, but it's vastly more difficult to run down numerous dead ends in hopes of finding something. Just as the bright spark at the heart of their investigation was beginning to flicker, the discovery of the first major piece of hard evidence would quickly reinvigorate their spirits. The discovery would be made by three young children searching for a missing dog in a sparsely populated, densely wooded area approximately 14 miles southeast from the parking garage. Ten-year-old Kimberly Stone, joined by her cousins Chris and Ginger Simpson, 11 and 9 respectively, were searching through a hilly, wooded area for a lost poodle at approximately 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, March 10th. The remote area, known locally as a lover's lane, is located directly beneath the Reinhardt Road Bridge, which spans the Little Cedar Creek near 82nd. The children found the brown leather bag with a shoulder strap in the creek bed with one side laying in the water. Unaware of the importance of what they had found, they returned to Kimberly's home, then located at 8141 Reinhardt Road, approximately two-tenths of a mile northeast from the discovery site. For you dog lovers out there, the missing poodle named Pierre was later recovered safely. Around 7 p.m., Kimberly's father, Stephen Stone, then employed as a detective for the Santa Fe Railroad, walked into his daughter's bedroom and saw the children playing with the bag and its contents. Quickly identifying real credit cards bearing Loy's name, he took the bag from the children and asked them where they had found it. After they explained, he quickly notified the local police, informing them that he believed they had found evidence in this highly publicized disappearance. This particular area was under the jurisdiction of the Lee's Summit Police Department, who dispatched officers and also notified the Kansas City Police, who in turn sent some detectives to the house. Arriving there, investigators were taken down to the area beneath the bridge, at which time they were directed to the approximate spot that the purse had been found. They would later specify the location as being east of Raytown and around a mile north of Unity Village and what was then Turner and Coburn Roads. The Missouri Pacific Railroad has tracks running through the area around 50 yards to the south of the creek. 
Examining the area, detectives described the purse's location as being just beyond the west edge of the bridge above. It did not appear as though the purse had been thrown from the bridge, and it was instead theorized that it had been gently dropped over the railing, or perhaps had been placed there by someone who was in the wooded area beneath the bridge. Though police hoped to search the area that night, the sun had set shortly before 6.30, and so the rural location had quickly grown dark. After approximately 15 officers conducted a fruitless search, the decision was made to cordon off the area at approximately 10.30 p.m. A squad car was parked beneath the bridge, and the area was watched overnight with plans to launch a massive search the following day. Around 7 a.m., searchers arrived in the area. In addition to both Kansas City and Lee's Summit police officers, they were joined by more than 50 recruits from the police academy. Around 9.45 a.m., police found part of a checkbook with Don's name on it and an open pack of cigarillos, which Loy was known to smoke, lying near the creek bed. They also recovered papers, some with Loy's name on them, scattered along the north bank of the creek. When investigators notified Don of the finding, he was quick to note that he could think of no reason his wife would have been in that area and he himself had no knowledge of her ever having been there previously. The purse itself was shown to Don, as well as several of Loy's friends and co-workers, all of whom identified the bag as belonging to her. An examination of the bag itself showed that it had sustained minimal damage other than the side which had laid in the water. Police analysts determined that the bag had been lying in the spot where it was recovered for likely no more than a day or two, which made police wonder if her abductor had thrown it out on his way out of town, or if perhaps this could be an indicator that Loy was still alive. It was a topic they didn't like discussing much, nor did they wish to speculate on, but the hard truth was that the longer the 29-year-old was missing, the greater the chance that she would not be found alive. All in all, it would later be revealed that, within the purse itself, police recovered prescription drugs with Loy's name on them, a pair of sunglasses, a pair of clear glasses, a Kansas driver's license with Loy's name on it, and several credit cards. Police also recovered a billfold with matched descriptions of one carried by Loy, and there were several smaller items for which exact descriptions were never given. After the first day's search, police decided to expand the perimeter and dramatically increase their search party. More than 80 recruits were brought in to help search a 12-square-mile area. They would be aided by police officers and volunteers on the ground, as well as a helicopter hovering above. Day two, however, would prove challenging, as strong rains flooded down hillsides and ravines, leaving bogs of mud up to knee-deep in some spots. Although determined to push the search on, Sergeant Wilson noted to the Kansas City Times that they were uncertain if the purse had been dumped there, or if perhaps... It was a diversionary tactic to draw their investigators away from the kidnapper's real trail. In hopes of contributing to the investigation, the law firm for which Loy had worked put a $1,000 reward for information in place and supplied local papers with the bank where they could also contribute to the fund. Locals were very aware of Loy's disappearance and it was described as a polarizing event. A brazen, broad daylight abduction had everyone's concerns raised, and they wanted to try to fight back in some way. Back home in Coffeyville, Loy's mother, Jewel, stated that all of the local churches had drawn together and were offering their prayers for the 29-year-old's safe return. On Wednesday, March 16th, over two weeks since Loy disappeared from the area of Country Club Plaza, a jogger made a disturbing discovery. A woman identified as Miss Rammel was jogging with her Doberman in the area of Little Blue River, approximately 250 yards south of US-40 in North Lee's Summit. Today, the area is home to multiple subdivisions, but at the time, it was quite rural, as Miss Rammel told police that she often rode her dune buggy through the area when she wasn't jogging. While out that morning, Rammel came upon a bra and a pair of women's underwear. Sergeant Wilson described the bra as faded and stained and the panties as torn in several places. The stains were a faint red-brownish color, which they thought could possibly be blood. 
The items themselves were sent to the Regional Criminalistics Laboratory in Independence, while a large police presence closed in on the area intent on searching more efficiently. Miss Rammel led police to the location, noting that she had found the items partially buried beneath a thick clump of leaves. More than 70 searchers spanned out over half a square mile, which they combed over twice before abandoning the search due to nightfall. All told, they found a rusted man's watch, two oil cans, several old shotgun shells, a squirrel skull, and two copperhead snakes. In order to ease their concerns during the search, several miles of traffic along US-40 were condensed down to one lane only, allowing searchers to park their vehicles along the busy roadway. Police considered the area as possibly being linked to the case, not just due to the finding, but also because it was just a few miles northeast from where the purse had been found, and both locations could be easily reached by small back roads, which were less traveled and therefore less likely to expose the driver to witnesses. After a full day of searching, it was decided that they would not return the following day. This decision was based in part on Don's inability to identify the undergarments as belonging to his missing wife. Evitz was taken down to the lab in Independence, and while he noted that the sizing was similar to what Loy would have worn, he didn't recognize the items themselves. Asked about this lack of identification later, Don would tell the Times, quote, She had awful good taste in clothing. She wouldn't wear underclothes in that kind of condition. End quote. On Friday, March 18th, Jackson County Sheriff Robert Renault announced that his department would be conducting a second search on the area surrounding where the purse had been found. He didn't believe a thorough enough search had been performed, and it was his hope that going back in would result in the discovery of some new evidence. He later explained to the Kansas City Times, saying, quote, It was too inclement for them to see anything they needed to. We'll be looking for anything at all that might have to do with the disappearance. They found the purse, and I'm hopeful of finding some other articles or anything that might be of possible benefit to the investigation. End quote. The search party consisted of 15 mounted members of the sheriff's posse, 20 officers on foot, and an observer riding above in a plane. Sheriff Renault planned to focus in on an area bordered by Reinhardt Bridge to the south, Little Blue Road to the north, and one mile to the east and west. While this search failed to turn up any new evidence, several creepy phone calls made by an anonymous man over that weekend would quickly grab the attention of investigators. And while they attempted to verify the information given by the caller and determine whether or not it was a sick prank, they also hoped to identify the man so they could bring him in for questioning. It was announced that a 34-year-old man living in the area of Grandview, 14 miles southwest from where the purse was found and 15 miles southeast from the home of Loy and Don, was taken into custody by authorities at his home. The arrest came after police successfully traced an anonymous call which had been placed from that location to the Lee's Summit Police Department. He was being held in Lee's Summit, and authorities noted that they had been in contact with the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office. While the man was in custody, it was noted that there were no determinations about probable charges, and investigators were questioning the man in an attempt to determine whether he truly had knowledge of the case or if it was an elaborate ruse. James Potter, then Assistant Director of Lee's Summit Police, explained, quote, there has been no determination at this point as far as the filing of charges on the disappearance and homicide. We're going on the assumption that we've got a good suspect, but we just don't know until we run the full gauntlet and check out all leads. End quote. Police noted that they were able to hold the man because a warrant had been issued for his arrest regarding the passing of bad checks back in Kansas. He was scheduled to be arraigned in Jackson County Magistrate Court on that charge. Asked about the search for additional evidence in the disappearance, Potter stated that they had conducted a search of the man's home, but did not reveal if anything was found. Following the arrest, a joint search was conducted by the Jackson County Sheriff's Department and the Kansas City Police Department, focusing in on areas which had previously been searched near to where the purse was found. 
The search, which began at approximately 9 a.m., fell into the boundaries of Unity Village in the south, Little Blue Road to the north, Lee's Summit Road in the east, and Noland Road in the west, encompassing an area just shy of five square miles. Ultimately, this search did not yield any new evidence, and though a pair of pantyhose and socks were found, they were not believed related to the case. Scott Huber, media liaison for the Kansas City Police, said the search had been prompted by information delivered by the anonymous caller. Huber expressed frustration regarding the information given by the caller, noting that investigators had flip-flopped on it. Apparently, while the Lee's Summit Police were working on the caller, the Kansas City Police didn't think the information was reliable at all. Huber, in a quote that exquisitely explains the chaos of jurisdictional dick measuring contests, explained, quote, That's why they were searching the other day, because he said search here. They started out thinking he was real, and then decided he was faking it, and now apparently are back to thinking he was real. I assume they have some basis for that. I don't know what it is. End quote. On Tuesday, March 22nd, 34-year-old Richard Lee Smith was identified as the man who had allegedly made the anonymous calls. Living then at a home on East 152nd Terrace in Grandview, 17 miles southeast from Loy's home, Smith was released on his own recognizance in regard to the fraudulent check charges and no charges related to the disappearance were filed. According to investigators, Smith placed multiple anonymous calls in which he delivered information he claimed to possess about Loy's disappearance. One call was placed directly to the Lee's Summit Police Department, while two others were made to local businesses. Asked why he was not charged, James Potter stated that while they could prove the calls came from Smith's home, they could not conclusively prove that he had been the one who made them. Interestingly, Potter noted that one of the places in which Smith was wanted for passing bad checks was in Overland Park, the same city in which Loy and Don lived. Reportedly, Smith made several statements alleging to know the location at which Loy's remains might be located, but following searches, nothing could be found, and it was ultimately determined that he had likely made the calls as a prank or based upon rumor and conjecture. Robert Pattison, Kansas City Police Department captain, noted that much of what the man relayed was information that had previously been published in local papers and that additional information he provided could not be verified. Potter went on to reveal that a combined 14 officers between Lee's Summit and Kansas City were working the case. The Jackson County Sheriff's Office was also involved, and they sent 12 deputies to search through two abandoned houses located off Bolin Road, southwest of U.S. Route 40, and approximately six miles northeast of where the purse was found. Deputies found that the name Loy Evitz had been spray-painted on an interior wall of the garage of one of the houses, though they could not say when the painting had been done. At the other home, they drained a cistern and searched along a half-mile stretch of Bolin Road, but found no signs of the missing woman. It was noted that the abandoned homes were in bad shape and were apparently popular locations for local teens to hang out and party. Potter stated that investigators were growing frustrated and they were approaching a standstill. Asked about any progress on the case, he said lab tests on evidence linked to Richard Smith had returned with negative results, though he would not say what that evidence was. He went on to note that without additional leads or new evidence, there was a high likelihood that most of the investigators assigned to the case would return to normal duty. Potter went on to say that they might conduct another search along a quarter mile stretch of I-470, which was under construction at the western edge of Lee's Summit. Investigators obtained information which suggested that Loy's body had been buried in the construction zone, but foot searches hadn't turned up any signs. Curiously, this information came from Richard Lee Smith, so it's another flop back to whether or not he was telling the truth. Police were debating whether or not to dig in the area because it could cause a significant delay to road construction and they had hoped to get a more specific location. Curiously, while discussing all of this, Potter told reporters that even though nearly a month had passed, 
they weren't still entirely convinced that Loy was dead. A few days later, it was announced that the Kansas City Police Department would be conducting a search along the construction area of I-470. Sergeant John Wilson said that the Kansas City Fire Department loaned them a methane detector and they were hoping it could help discover a location to dig. They were planning to probe the dirt beneath the roadbed and if Loy were buried there, they hoped to detect methane gas which is given off by a decomposing body. The stretch of highway to be checked was described as being a tenth of a mile west of View High Drive, approximately seven miles southwest from where the purse had been located. While conducting the search, investigators were overwhelmed by the scope of what needed to be done, with some referring to it as searching for a needle in a haystack. The area focused on was a quarter mile long, 40 feet wide, 10 to 12 feet deep in some places, and covered with 90,000 cubic yards of rock and dirt fill, which was dumped there on March 1st, allegedly after the body had been placed there. Police conducted some digging with a small backhoe, the bucket of which could only handle a half a yard of cubic dirt at a time. Digging lasted for three hours on Thursday, March 24th, focusing in on areas that the methane detector indicated the possible presence of human remains. One trench they dug was described as 40 feet long and 7 feet deep. Another hole they had dug was 12 feet wide and 12 feet deep. Nothing was found at the time, with Sergeant John Wilson noting that it would be helpful for specifics, telling the Times, quote, We're trying to make an educated guess on where to dig, and I don't think it's that educated yet, end quote. Investigators noted that while the methane detector could mean a body was there, methane is also released by decaying vegetation and can result in a false positive. In hopes of enhancing their search efforts, law enforcement also utilized search dogs, as well as infrared photographic equipment supplied and operated by Gary Compton, then president of Paralegal Services Incorporated. Compton explained that heat signatures released from decomposing materials as deep as 100 feet below the surface would show up when the film was developed, allowing police to zero in on specific spots. Though calling off the search as night fell, law enforcement stated they would return if the infrared images showed any indication that there was a body nearby. While this search was being done, more than 150 members of the Missouri National Guard made an offer to come and conduct a more thorough search of the area surrounding where Loy's purse had been found. Sergeant Wilson stated that to that point, nearly a month after the disappearance, they had utilized more than 3,000 man hours working the case and could use more help. Much of it, though, was frustrating due to their inability to take action, with Wilson saying, quote, The hardest part of any of this is the waiting. There's nothing you can do. If we find a body, it will come down to the hard work. The shovels, spoons, and the investigation will go into high gear. Right now, it's a waiting game. End quote. On Sunday, March 27th, the search was officially called off, with police saying they were unlikely to do additional searches. One of the infrared images had shown what appeared to be a human body, but upon digging out the area, they instead found a large rock had, which had retained much of its heat. The National Guard did conduct their search as well for approximately five hours, north of US 50 and Chipman Road in the area near the Truman Medical Center, approximately one mile from the purse location beneath Reinhardt Road Bridge. Some clothing items were found, though they could not be connected to Loy, and after all of that, the Lee's Summit Police announced they were pulling out of the investigation and turning all aspects of it back over to Kansas City authorities. James Potter of the Lee's Summit PD told the media that they had done a thorough job, saying, quote, The part that we were told the body might be buried in, they really tore up. When they were through, they were satisfied that she wasn't in there. End quote. March 28th marked one month since Loy had last been seen, and by that point, the case was growing stagnant. In early April, Sergeant Wilson told reporters that their chances of finding Loy safe did not look good, and they hadn't managed to obtain any new evidence or leads in the weeks following her disappearance. 
Her case file had grown to be four inches thick. Between 200 and 300 people had been interviewed, and more than 1,000 calls and tips about the case had been pursued and closed down. Wilson stated that every body of water from Lake Jacomo west to the state line and from Country Club Plaza south to the Cass County line had been searched. They dug up cisterns and wells. They dug anywhere there could possibly be a grave or where they found disturbed earth. Unfortunately, they never found anything. Asked about the anonymous caller, Richard Smith, Sergeant Wilson was stuck between a rock and a hard place when it came to that possibility. He told the Kansas City Star, quote, I can't dismiss him yet. I don't have that much faith in the man's statements. I don't think that he was involved, but he could have knowledge. He could just be an anonymous caller who never thought he'd get caught. I'm upset enough about this case. I probably won't give up until I turn up something. I'd just like somebody to give me a call to say that she's alive or that she's dead. Alive, mainly. There's still a possibility she's alive, and that's the way I'd like to find her. End quote. Wilson went on to say that Smith had claimed responsibility for Loy's murder during the calls, but when confronted during interrogation, he denied any involvement. Sadly, at this point, the investigation slowed, and the case began growing cold. Saturday, May 28th, marked three months since the 29-year-old had mysteriously vanished from her employer's parking garage. Little had been learned to that point, and Sergeant Wilson had spent much of his time trying to track down any new information. He packed boots and a shovel into the trunk of his car just in case he might need to dig somewhere. He tracked down a stripper who bore a striking resemblance to Loy, but was able to confirm she was a different person. Wilson said that, to that day, the best lead they possessed was the witness account of an unknown man speeding out of the parking garage behind the wheel of a brown van. However, they still couldn't identify the man, nor could they find the van. Both in the police department and in the lives of those who knew and loved Loy, the overwhelming sentiment was that she was dead and would likely not be found. Wilson refused to fully accept this, later telling the Kansas City Star, quote, it's gotten down to the point where we've run everything out. Everybody who knew her takes it for granted that she's dead. I'll probably keep my interest going for some time or until I reach the same conclusion. End quote. Two months later, in late July, the partial remains of an unidentified woman were found by a marina owner on the North Little Rock side of the Arkansas River, approximately 400 miles south from Kansas City. The remains, described as only a lower torso from the waist to the ankles, were considered as possibly being loy due to the fact that estimates of height and weight matched the victim and she appeared to be dressed in similar clothing to what loy had last worn. Police said the body was estimated to have been in the water for 7 to 10 months, which would put it outside of the range for loy, but they weren't absolutely certain. William Livingston, a detective in Kansas City, was sent south on Wednesday, July 27th to speak to investigators and to bring photos and hair samples for comparison. Just a few days later, the body was ruled out. Reportedly, the clothing did not match what she had last worn. The body appeared heavier and was thought to have belonged to an older person, and both photos and hair samples did not match. Captain Robert Pattinson would later tell the Arkansas City Traveler, quote, We feel certain it is not her there are enough dissimilarities to make us sure, end quote. While the discovery had brought the case back into the headlines, it quickly fell back out as detectives remained without solid leads or evidence to pursue. Sergeant Wilson stated that, in the beginning, they received around 20 calls a day with tips, but now, months later, they only received calls once in a while, and usually, the information was run down and quickly ruled out. Asked about the status of the case one month later in late August, Sergeant Wilson replied that while he was dedicated to finding Loy, everything had slowed and was mostly frozen in place. When asked for a similar case that came to mind, Wilson replied, quote, maybe Jimmy Hoffa, end quote. He went on to explain, quote, of course every large city has its own Miss Evitz type case. 
We have people every day that for some reason vanish off the face of the earth. People never know what happened to that person unless they've been standing in their shoes. Most who disappear want to disappear. End quote. Wilson noted that he had returned to that quarter-mile stretch of I-470 that had been searched in March. Upon this second search, even more sensitive infrared film was used, but returned the same negative result. Though he couldn't prove it, Wilson believed that if Loy had been murdered, her body would be found somewhere in the area. He continued to follow up on unidentified bodies found throughout the country, but in his personal opinion, he believed the answer lay close to home. During this discussion, Sergeant Wilson revealed new details about the investigation which had not previously been made public. Firstly, he noted that they had struggled to obtain copies of Loy's fingerprints. Apparently, the 29-year-old was so meticulous that she had a habit of wiping down everything she touched. They checked the cosmetics case in her work desk and found it had no prints. They examined her car, but again, no prints, and the same was true of her typewriter. In hopes that she might have typed something that could give them some insight to her disappearance, they pulled the ribbon at her office desk and examined it. What they found was a professional letter written for work, followed by a cryptic stream of random numbers and letters. They would later find out in the days following her disappearance that one of the law firm's partner's children had sat at her desk and punched the keys for entertainment. Strangely, Wilson said that both Don and Loy had some indiscernible fear about something bad happening to her in the days and weeks leading up to her disappearance. Don told police that he experienced a dark feeling, like one he'd had in Vietnam before combat led to the death of a close friend. He worried about Loy shopping by herself for too long and told her that she needed to be more careful when she was out on her own. Don told investigators that Loy herself had been shaken by a growing sense of fear and dread, indicating that something terrible would happen to her. He explained, quote, She had kind of a premonition about a week before this happened. She said she was going to die. She came back and told me what cemetery she wanted to be buried in. End quote. Asked about the possibility of Don himself being involved, Wilson was dismissive. Though he did not give much information, he relayed that investigators were very convinced that he had not been involved. He cooperated fully with the investigation, was at work during the time of Loy's disappearance, and had voluntarily sat for a three-hour-long polygraph examination, the results of which confirmed to police that he had no idea what could have happened. Don himself noted that there were those who believed he was involved, and he understood that perspective, but he argued anyone who was close to either he or Loy and knew their relationship would never think that for a second. Over the course of the next year, the case grew quiet. Don struggled to keep his life together, finding that friends slowly pulled away as they were unable to deal with the situation. While they married, had children, and moved forward, Don was stuck reaching back for a past that was forever unattainable. He couldn't decide what to do. At some points, he thought of selling the house and moving away, but ultimately decided against it. He struggled as, on the one hand, the house kept him feeling close to Loy, but on the other, he couldn't help but jump up every time he heard a car approaching or the phone ringing, wondering if she was somehow finally coming back to him. He was tormented by prank callers who rang him in the middle of the night to claim they had information that Loy was alive or that they had grisly details of her murder to reveal. Even some who had the best of intentions would push him into a depression, with both friends and co-workers frequently asking for news and updates that had never come. At one point, his bosses at work had to send out an office memo asking co-workers to leave the grieving man alone and to stop bombarding him with questions and theories about what might have happened. Initially, Don turned to alcohol, and began frequenting local bars in hopes of numbing away all of the pain and hurt, but it only made things worse, negatively impacting his employment as his drinking grew out of control. He explained, quote, It cost me a couple of jobs because I was drinking too much. I tried to tough it out, but when I was alone, I cried. I really cried. End quote. 
Tuesday, February 28, 1978, marked a full year since Loy had last been seen alive. The case remained in a lull, and by that time, almost everyone connected to it, both law enforcement and family, had accepted the likelihood that the 29-year-old was dead and would not be returned safely. The investigation had transformed from a missing persons case to that of a homicide, and detectives believed that, at some point, they would find Loy's body. Even for Don, who had tried so hard to hope for the best, he had to confront that reality, saying, quote, I have prepared myself mentally and accept that I will never see her again. End quote. Don had done several things to try and take steps forward. He redecorated parts of the home they had shared and sold Loy's beloved sports car, noting he never drove it and he didn't believe she would want it just collecting dust in the garage. He sent some of her clothing and personal items back to her family in Coffeyville and slowly began isolating himself. He took up new hobbies and began leaving the house less and less. Though he had tried dating a little bit, it felt wrong to him, and eventually he cut that off as well. As for investigators, they had pretty much resigned themselves to the fact that the case would not move forward without something more substantial, specifically a body. Sergeant Wilson explained to the Kansas City Star, saying, quote, We knew within an hour where she was when she disappeared from the parking lot of the plaza, and we know where her purse was found, and that's about all the hard evidence we have. I suspect she is buried in a shallow grave somewhere in the area where her purse was found, but if you don't have a body, you don't have a homicide. End quote. Following the passing of that first year, time began to proceed more rapidly. Discussion of the investigation, media coverage of the case, and calls about Loy dried up. There were flashes of possibility here and there. Several bodies found in and around the area searched previously would stir up talk about Loy, but she was ruled out every time. Each time, Don was contacted and told to brace himself, only for it to be a false alarm. In the mid-80s, at the height of speculation circling around the claims of killer Henry Lee Lucas, it was thought that he could have been involved, but he was ruled out when evidence contradicted the possibility and the confession killer himself denied any involvement. In 1984, following the required passage of seven years, Don had Loy legally declared deceased. He would then go on to file a lawsuit against the insurance company, which did not wish to pay out her total death benefit due to the fact that her body was not recovered, a battle Don would ultimately win. The law firm in which she had been employed, that of Miller, Simmons, Moore, and Young, established a scholarship in her name for the education of law enforcement officers at Rockhurst College. The last time there was much discussion of Loy or the case came in February of 1987, which marked a full decade since the 29-year-old had last been seen. While Don declined to tear open old wounds for an interview at that time, Loy's mother, Jewel, 75 then, agreed to share her thoughts. In her mind, her daughter was stolen away by a monster without a name or a face. She explained, quote, Somebody was there at the time they shouldn't have been there, and they snatched her out of this world. I have prayed that those who did it would have a conscience and confess. End quote. 33 years later. Tuesday, February 28th, 2017, officially marked 40 years since Loy disappeared. And while much of Kansas City, the 29-year-old knew and loved, would then be unrecognizable to her, little had changed with the investigation. Sergeant John Wilson retired, and Sergeant Ben Caldwell was now in charge. In hopes of jogging something loose, they took another look at the case file, now well over a foot thick and decided to re-interview key witnesses to determine if anything had been missed or if there were new avenues to pursue. Don was one of the first people detectives went to, and according to Caldwell, there was little, if any, difference between their discussion with him in 1977. He explained, quote, He broke down and cried, much like he did in 1977 when he was interviewed by police. He obviously is very heartbroken. End quote. Meeting with Don, 
Law enforcement was given hair from one of Loy's hairbrushes, which she had kept all those years, allowing them to get her DNA and officially add it to nationwide databases, including NamUs. That was really the only new development, with Sergeant Caldwell being quite blunt that chances of finding an answer all these years later was very unlikely. They were still perplexed by what exactly happened that chilly Monday afternoon in Kansas City. Sergeant Caldwell explained, quote, There are still no new leads, and right now the case is suspended pending new information. This one is a little more unique because she was abducted. She was either targeted or it was complete happenstance that somebody abducted her. It's very obvious that it was an abduction, end quote. For the first time in decades, Don, 71 years old in 2017, agreed to sit down for an interview again. So much time had passed, but the wounds were still tender, and for him, escaping from the pain of loss transformed his entire life. The Kansas City Star noted that his home, the very one he had shared with Loy, was now covered in model train sets, a hobby he picked up to try and keep his mind distracted. He also learned to play guitar, having written some songs about Loy and the heaviness of the grief with which he has struggled. He continued to hope that someday someone would provide the information necessary to locate Loy, that someone might be arrested and charged, but he acknowledged that he didn't have much faith in that. David Evitz, Don's brother, summed up the pain and loss of all of those years, saying, quote, It put him into a depression that I don't think he's ever been able to overcome. Don never remarried, never dated again. Loy was the one and only love of his life. End quote. When last seen, Loy Gillespie Evitz was described as being a white female with blonde hair and hazel eyes, standing five feet, five inches tall, and weighing approximately 126 pounds. Loy was last seen wearing a three-quarter length blue hand-knit sweater with vertical maroon stripes, a maroon turtleneck, maroon slacks, wood wedge shoes with a brown leather strap. She also wore a wide gold wedding band, a wide gold Hellsberg diamond solitaire engagement ring, a white gold woman's watch with a square face, and a plaid gold bracelet with a knot. At the time, she drove a yellow 1970 MGB sports car with the license plate JOE 4869. It's believed that she drove the car into the parking garage just north of Country Club Plaza, where she worked at the time, between 2.45 and 3 p.m. on Monday, February 28th, 1977. Somewhere between her vehicle in spot number 98 and her office at 800 West 47th Street, she was either forcibly abducted or got into a vehicle with someone she thought she could trust. A delivery man in the area at the time notified authorities that an unknown man driving a large brown van had sped out of the parking lot at the approximate time Loy is thought to have been taken. This witness did not catch the license plate nor was he able to identify the driver since the unknown man shielded his face with his hand. The van pulled out so quickly and recklessly that it nearly collided with another vehicle. Neither this man or the brown van have ever been located or officially identified. Loy was 29 years old when she vanished, and if alive today, she would be turning 77 this December. She has now been missing for 47 years, nearly twice as long as she was able to live her life. Both of her parents, William and Jewel Gillespie, have since passed, as has her brother John. They carried their grief and pain with them and never relinquished the hope that someday they would know the truth and see justice done. As for Don, he has spent nearly five decades continuing to grieve for the loss of his wife, a flashbulb moment from which he has never been able to move forward. According to everyone who knew them, Loy was the love of his life, and without her, he struggled to find a reason to press on. He lives now in the quiet solace of the home they had once shared, a home which by this time he had fully expected to be flooded with visits from grandchildren and friends, a home 
which suffers tremendously from the absence of the life and love that had once filled it. Asked his thoughts all these years later, Don somberly replied, quote, She's been gone this long. You can't expect her to come back and still be alive. We just don't know. I learned to never get my hopes up too much because they all failed in the end. Surely someone knows something. The investigation into the disappearance of Loy Evitz is simultaneously filled with a lot of information but bereft of solid, reliable evidence. Detectives were able to dig into her life, her husband's life, everything going all the way back to her upbringing in Coffeyville, Kansas. They were able to piece together almost every aspect of the last day she was seen alive. They mapped out where she went on her lunch break and narrowed her return to the parking garage to within a 5-10 to 10 minute period and then everything stops. They know she parked her car in her assigned spot, but somewhere after that, she completely vanished. When someone disappears, there's usually something for them to work on, some lead to follow, some evidence to pursue, but they come up with a blank in this case. The closest they ever really got to a lead was statements from the eyewitnesses who saw a brown van speeding out of the garage around the time they thought Loy had likely been abducted. Later, they would get more information from Richard Smith, the so-called anonymous caller, but they couldn't verify any of what he had told them as he flipped from claiming responsibility to denying any involvement whatsoever. The investigation itself was an exercise in futility for the most part, with every lead being run down and every clue being analyzed, but they continually found themselves reset to square one, looking for the ghosts of what happened in that parking garage. Now, I fully admit I had an awareness of this case for years, but I had never dug much beneath the surface level. When I dove into the research, I was under the impression that I would come out on the other side with a fairly decent idea of what most likely happened. That's true of most cases I've covered. I generally have my own opinion of what probably occurred. But at least in this instance, much like the investigators, I don't have real solid clues to work with. I mean, sure, it seems likely that Loy was abducted, but when you go down to the motive and the suspects, there's nothing there. You have a likely crime, but no one to point the finger at, and as a result, that makes it pretty difficult to analyze the theories, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. The first theory, and by general consensus the weakest, is that perhaps Loy left of her own volition and was either assisted by others or orchestrated and pulled off this disappearance without telling anyone. In a lot of missing persons cases that are severely lacking in terms of evidence, this is a theory that is proposed on a basis of, essentially, anything is possible, so maybe this was all part of a plan. While there have certainly been cases over the years in which someone disappeared for years and was later found alive and well, having chosen to do so, those instances are very rare. Usually they involve more than someone simply walking away. We know for a fact that Lloyd didn't take any of her personal belongings. She never accessed any of her bank accounts or personal funds, and no one in her life had any reason to believe she would ever run off. What I think makes this the least likely is that in the hours leading up to Lloyd's disappearance, she's spotted by multiple people store employees, other shoppers, people out on the street, she was easily and quickly noticed. It's somewhat difficult to believe that less than 20 minutes after being spotted by multiple people, she would suddenly become a ghost that managed to escape from the parking garage seemingly without another vehicle, but no one saw her during this time. Her image, her description was broadcast on the radio, local news stations, and flyers were put up all over the area, but no one saw anything after around 2.45. It's not to say it's impossible that Loy got away unnoticed or perhaps utilized some type of disguise, but now we're getting into an area that feels less and less realistic. Police dug into Loy's life, and they couldn't find anything that might suggest she wanted to get away nor anything she might be afraid of. She had no financial problems, no secret rendezvous, no hidden relationships or activities, at least that they could find. Although somewhat tongue-in-cheek, Sergeant Wilson did refer to her at one point as a saint, 
Obviously, no one is a saint, but she appears to have walked the straight and narrow to a degree where if she ever did step outside of that box, nobody knew about it. Certainly, there could be a motive that law enforcement were unable to track down, but the biggest indicator that Lloyd did not disappear of her own volition is that nearly 50 years later, she has never been seen nor heard from again. Her social security card was never used, her bank account was untouched, and to top it all off, her prescription medication was found in her purse along with her checkbooks and driver's license. I know many of you are thinking what I am, that running away is a baseless theory in this case, but I did want to address it just for the sake of being thorough. A possibility? Perhaps. But even detectives don't believe there's enough to support this as a possible theory. The next theory that has some weight behind it in the beginning, but has thinned out tremendously over the years, is that Loy's husband, Don, was in some way connected to the disappearance. Whenever someone goes missing or is murdered, the people closest to them always fall under the microscope of suspicion to some degree, and the spouse is often the most likely. This doesn't necessarily mean that the spouse had to have been involved, but to not look into that person and their relationship with the victim would be a bad decision by detectives and a tremendous oversight in any investigation. According to what we know about this case, Don came home that night to a ringing phone and it was his wife's boss. They explained she had not returned from her lunch break and they were concerned. Don contacted authorities to report his wife missing, but they didn't really do anything at that moment, giving him the old, oh, wait 24 hours excuse, because that always works out so well. Over the course of the next few hours, Don went downtown and tried to find Loy. He called friends and family members. He went to some of her favorite stores, but he couldn't find anything. Around midnight, he went home to wait by the phone in case she called, or perhaps law enforcement showed more interest. When none of this happened and the investigation kicked off for real the following day, he was seemingly paralyzed by fear and anxiety. He couldn't go to work, couldn't sleep, could barely eat. Friends and relatives came by to look after him because he seemed incapable of taking care of himself as he struggled with the harsh reality of this loss. Lacking evidence as they were, investigators took a long, hard look at Don. They dug into his past, talked to friends, relatives, co-workers. They searched for anything they might find to give them a reason to believe he had a motive. They came up completely empty-handed and instead developed a profile on the man that suggested he was completely in love with his wife and arguably, to some degree, dependent upon her. For years, his life had revolved around Loy, and the same could be said for her in regard to Don. Their relationship was strong and loving. They spent years apart and wrote daily letters while he was in Vietnam, while she was away at college. They went out of their way to visit as often as possible, and then when they were both able to, they got married on the anniversary of their first date. According to detectives, they could only find evidence that the couple had ever had one argument, and that had happened years earlier before they married. There's no such thing as a perfect couple. Every relationship has its ups and downs. But there's a distinction between a troubled relationship and a happy one. And law enforcement could find no person who defined Loy and Don as anything other than a healthy, happy marriage between two people who were clearly in love. Usually in a case in which the spouse is involved, there's something more to it. A possible divorce, a monetary bonus, a bitter and hateful argument, or a dispute. But none of that happens here. Not to mention, Loy doesn't vanish from home. She doesn't go missing on a trip the two took together or from a quiet location that they frequent. It's not that he doesn't call police for days. There's nothing really suspicious about his behavior. She vanishes from a parking garage in the middle of the day. At the time of the crime, Don's at work. His job was a little more than five miles north from Loy's office building, but there are no reports of him leaving early, taking an extended lunch break, or being sighted in the area. Police question him thoroughly and report back that he broke down emotionally, and in their experience, these are not fake emotions in an attempt to cast suspicion off of him. While I'm not a huge proponent of lie detectors, they do sit him down for a lengthy three-hour polygraph examination 
and he passes with flying colors. I think, at least for me, what convinces me most that Don was likely not involved is how he spends the next 47 years of his life. He dates for a very short period, but eventually quits. He stops going out and socializing and withdraws into the home they shared together. He pretty much becomes a recluse, with even his own brother saying that the loss of his wife completely devastated him and he didn't know how to move on and start again. He finds himself struggling with alcohol addiction, loses jobs over the combination of substance abuse and an inability to focus on things outside of Lloyd. He doesn't move into a bigger house, buy a bunch of random stuff. He doesn't appear happy in the slightest. And while there is a life insurance policy on Loy, there's also one in him. I mean, he worked for an insurance company, so this isn't all that surprising. And he isn't able to cash in the policy for seven years until 1984. When he does, their numbers are far from exorbitant and the total death benefit paid out $20,000. That is not a life-changing amount of money. And while people have been killed for far less, it doesn't really make any sense in this case. Some people have argued that some of Don's behaviors in the months and years after the disappearance carry a sinister tone, but that's really more of a matter of opinion and speculation. He sells Loy's beloved car, but notes he never drove it, and it was a constant reminder of his loss. This doesn't really rattle my cage or jump out as some big red flag. He sends much of her clothing and personal effects to her family and donates others to local charity shops. He takes down a lot of the pictures of Loy, but he keeps them all, storing them gently in a bin downstairs. Yet when law enforcement needs a source of Loy's DNA, he's able to give them one of her hairbrushes that still has her hair in it, suggesting he has kept items of hers in good enough condition that they appear somewhat undisturbed. He didn't pack everything up and haul it out to the trash. He slowly comes to grips with reality and agrees with friends, family, and detectives that Loy is probably deceased. He stops doing interviews and lives a quiet, simple life by himself. Decades later, he does a handful of interviews in 2017, marking 40 years since the disappearance, but he comes across as a man who is still crushed by what happened. There's no joy in his life. Nothing that would suggest he's better off or happy about the way anything went. Even police say that when they interview him again that year, those old wounds are torn open and he breaks down emotionally. If it's an act, he's done a masterful job of keeping it going for nearly 50 years. Now, much of what I've just discussed is emotional, personal. But stepping out into the harsh light of unbiased, cold hard facts... There has never been a single scrap of evidence presented to suggest Don was involved in any way whatsoever, and police have never really believed that he was. Sergeant John Wilson developed a deep-seated interest in this case. He spent years trying to crack it and spent so much energy digging in that he would later report that he felt like he knew Loy even though he had never met her. It was the one case he worked that he could never solve, and it stayed with him, broke his heart, and frustrated him beyond the point where he could rationalize it. He didn't believe Dom was involved. It was a possibility they ruled out early on, and I think retrospect and hindsight have only worked to confirm those beliefs. Could Don have been involved? Well, maybe. But over 47 years, no one has managed to come up with a motive And perhaps more importantly, they've never been able to develop a theory on how exactly he could have pulled this off. So if Don wasn't involved, is it possible that someone else Loy knew and maybe even trusted could have been? Certainly. But again, we're chasing ghosts here because police have never even suggested there was a person of interest in this case, let alone one that was known to and close to the victim. Some have wondered over the years if it's possible that Loy could have had male suitors, not necessarily men that she entertained, but men who perhaps expressed interest that she rebuffed. Researching this case, something you come across frequently are deep descriptions and opinions given about Loy's physical appearance. She's described as beautiful, eye-catching, a model, all of the things you might imagine of someone who receives a lot of compliments and flirtation from men. 
This has led some to believe that perhaps a man with an interest in Loy was frustrated by her dismissal and decided to take matters into his own hands. And I don't think that's something that can be completely ruled out. Let's face it, it was 1977. And while creepers exist in all places and times, we're talking about a time where, well, I don't want to say it was accepted, but people tended to look the other way. It's entirely possible some guy would not take no for an answer and probably carried a much higher likelihood than the previously discussed theories. At the time, you'd think someone would have noticed something. Based on everything we're told, Lloyd didn't complain to friends or family. She didn't tell her husband or coworkers anything about a guy who creeped her out or someone she worried about or thought was trying to cross a line. Sure, it's possible she didn't think it was that big of a deal, or maybe she didn't want people to see her in a bad light, but you'd think someone somewhere would have had some indication. At the same time, it's possible it could have been someone who had those thoughts and motives, but did not express them. A coworker who seemed like a nice guy, a friend who thought she was reliable and genuine. We don't know how many people were in or around the parking garage that day, and while we have a delivery man who reports a van speeding out around the time Loy is thought to have been taken, there are no reports of screams or any signs of a struggle. Police can find no evidence in or around the car or the garage to show any kind of a struggle or fight. When Loy's purse is recovered from beneath Reinhardt Road Bridge, there's no damage to it, no indication that there was a struggle or anything was stolen from her. Her checkbooks, billfold, and other items are recovered in the purse and in the area surrounding it. It sounds as if it's almost possible that there wasn't any kind of fight or struggle at all, suggesting that perhaps Loy voluntarily got into a vehicle with her abductor, perhaps not knowing where that drive would lead. It was a chilly afternoon, she had a walk to the office, and maybe someone she knew offered to drive her to the front door. It's as probable as anything else. However, the absence of a struggle doesn't necessarily mean that she went along voluntarily. It's one of the details I often find frustrating in cases like this, as if the lack of a struggle eliminates the concept of forced abduction. How much of a struggle is someone going to put up if an assailant sticks a knife in their face or it pulls a gun and tells them to be quiet and get in the car? I don't think we can rule out the possibility that Loy was forced to go along, and that carries us into the other half of this theory, that maybe she was taken by someone she didn't know, a complete stranger in what could be described as a random crime, or may actually have involved someone who specifically targeted her and may have tracked her for a period of time, as few as hours or as long as weeks or months. One detail of this case that's always bothered me is the timing of the abduction. Loy normally took her lunch between 1 and 2 p.m., but on this day, because she's finishing up work, she doesn't leave until after 2. Her movements over the course of the next 45 minutes or so are well established. We know where she went and what she did. During none of her lunch activities are there reports of her being with anyone else. Everyone seems to say that she was her normal, quiet, but polite self and they saw no indications that she was concerned or in any danger. Some have theorized that someone might have executed a planned abduction that day, and while I don't necessarily disagree, the shifting of her lunch break had to have thrown a wrench into any plans. Something I've always thought about a lot is why, if someone were targeting Loy, they would not have grabbed her elsewhere along her lunch break or right when she walked into the parking garage to drive off and do errands in the first place. Abducting her when she first enters the garage, you're guaranteed at least an hour before anyone notices anything is wrong. This affords you a pretty decent lead on your getaway. Instead, she's taken with 10 minutes of when she's supposed to be returning to work. Now, maybe changing her lunchtime altered things, but someone still had to be in that parking garage when she returned to grab her lunch. But again, if you're sitting there waiting, how do you allow her to leave in the first place? It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And maybe I'm seeking logic in an irrational place, but this just sticks in my head and I can't dismiss it. Now, maybe this was a planned abduction, but not one that involved keeping track of Loy for weeks or even days. It's entirely possible that while she was out on her lunch break that afternoon, someone saw her and decided they were going to grab her. Maybe this person or persons follows her, 
But everywhere she goes is a little too busy to make the grab. So they wait. And when she drives into the parking garage, they follow her in. We know from police that the car was in good condition. The umbrella she bought was sitting on the passenger seat and the car was unlocked. We don't know if Loy was in the habit of leaving her car unlocked or if this suggests she was grabbed very quickly after getting out of the vehicle. Given the description of the brown van, it's not outside of possibility that one person either forces her in, whether using a weapon or not to keep her quiet, or if perhaps one person is driving and another pulls her in, at which point they speed off. Entirely plausible. There is some discussion online about a motorcycle gang operating in the area around this time whose leader was later executed for murder. According to an article discussing the execution of George Tiny Mercer, he was executed for murder but had been involved in many other crimes, most of which involved sexual assault. According to a timeline established by law enforcement, Mercer participated in the gang rape of a 17-year-old in July of 1978. One month later, in late August, he rapes 22-year-old Karen Keaton, strangles her to death, and hides her body in a wooded area. Keaton went missing after working a shift at the Blue 7 Lounge, 11816 Blue Ridge Boulevard in Kansas City. This is a location that, by car, is just over 10 miles from where Lloyd's purse is recovered. Not only does Keaton vanish from the parking lot of her job, but her car is left behind in good condition, unlocked. Factor in that Keaton shares physical similarities with Loy. She is described as 5'7", 120 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. She disappears 19 months after Loy, but her body would actually be recovered. Keaton's remains were found in October of 1978, near the intersection of 207th Street and State Line Road, approximately 22 miles south from the office where Loy was last seen and 15 miles from where Keaton was last seen. Mercer was ultimately charged with capital murder, found guilty, and executed in 1989. Now, while no evidence has ever been established to connect Mercer to Loy's disappearance, there is one common denominator which is difficult to ignore. Multiple news articles refer to Mercer and his accomplice, Stephen Gardner, as living in Grandview, Missouri. Grandview just happens to be where Richard Lee Smith lived when he made multiple anonymous calls claiming knowledge of Loy's abduction and murder. Is there a solid connection there? Not that we've ever seen or established, but that's one hell of a coincidence. Was Richard Smith connected to the gang? Did he have knowledge of the crime? Did he know Mercer or Gardner? Or was he just a prank caller who seemed really focused on delivering information to law enforcement about where to find the body? We may never know. Unfortunately, that's true of all the unknown suspects in this case. The thousands and thousands of people passing through and working in Kansas City who could have been involved in this terrible, haunting crime. You could go on for hours or days with different possibilities, from a serial killer living in Kansas City at the time to the so-called confession killer himself, Henry Lee Lucas. But it is little more than speculation without some kind of evidence or eyewitness. Someone out there knows what happened and has kept that secret for decades. Someone out there has information they can provide to law enforcement to help them recover Loy's remains make an arrest, or both. Loy's family has passed away, but Don remains and continues to hope that someday justice will be served, or at least he will learn the fate of his beloved wife and be granted the ability to lay her to rest in the very cemetery she chose. Unfortunately, unless someone does come forward, new evidence is uncovered, or Loy's body is found, the vanishing of Loy Evitz will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Loy Evitz, there are many forums and newspaper archives which have detailed the case. For this episode... Both the Kansas City Star and Kansas City Times were the most helpful. 
If you have any information about the vanishing of Loy Evitz, please contact the Kansas City Police Department at 816-234-5136. Her case number is 00-J81177. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers, without whom Trace Evidence would not be possible. Andrew Guarino, Ann M. Bertram, Brutalist, Christine Greco, Crystal J., Danny Renee, Dearthy, Denise Dingsdale, Desiree Laro, Diani Dyson, Jennifer Winkler, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, K.Y., Lars Jensen Van Gel, Leslie B., Lisa Hobson, Melissa Breckheisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Ruth, Stacy Finnegan, and Tom Radford. Thank you all so much for your amazing support and for keeping trace evidence going forward. This concludes our look into the baffling disappearance of 29-year-old Loy Evans. A beautiful life needlessly ended, and the pain and grief of devastation left in the wake. Frustrating though it may be, it appears quite clear that a sheer lack of evidence and the silence of those with knowledge is what has kept this the oldest unsolved missing persons case in Kansas City history. I want to thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.